So, as many of you guys know, John Henry, entrepreneur in DC, and a lot of you are excited that he's here, so am I. And we know he was a, he's a CUNY alumnus, BNCC. Yes, I dropped out of college. And you know uh, that, right? So, <laughs> we're all trying to find, figure out, you know, he dropped out of college, he started this company, so two years later, went on to other venture adventures, and the question is, you know, like, what's the backstory? Like, that's what we want to know. Like, can you elaborate on, you know, the venture there, the struggles, the you know, student? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay, cool. Awesome. Well, how many of you guys have a little bit of context, just so I gauge the room here? Okay, awesome. That means a lot. Thank you, everyone. Um, cool, yeah, so I'll, I'll just run through briefly the trajectory, but um, the most important thing in my life, period, is being from an immigrant family uh, and coming from my folks from the Dominican Republic. You're Dominican too, right? Jamaican. Jamaican? Okay. Any Dominicans here? Hey! <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's the most important thing in my life by far because we grew up not too far from here in the Heights, Washington Heights. 285 Fort Washington, baby. 173 in Fort Wash. Went to PS 173 right across the street um, with my brother who's on the camera. Shout out to Jeffrey. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, those, those early years were so formative. I mean, we grew up broke, but Everyone in the Heights was broke growing up in the 90s, so it didn't feel like a thing. It just felt like, you know, family. It felt like, you know, that closeness, togetherness. But anyway, uh, fast forward a little bit. We moved to Florida for some time because my, my family, my mom was kind of scared to raise kids here in the 90s in New York. It was kind of rough. Um, and, you know, so I did my stint there, and when I came back to the city, I was 18, I was really, I was catching that itch. I was like, yo, I feel like I need to have, I want to say have an impact, but have an impact sounds very rah-rah, sounds very like, that's not how I was thinking. I just knew that I needed to do some shit, and I didn't know what that was going to be, but I felt like, damn, if it was going to be anywhere, it would be right here. And... That's facts, like there's people all over the world when they think of coming here to this country, they think of this city specifically. Um, and so I came here you know, with, with big dreams. And, um, and so yeah, that's what brought me here. So do you want to keep the kind of Q&A? That, that, that hustle, that yeah. everyday hustle of being in New York and have to you know, strive to make sure your family is situated as well as making sure you could fend for the next day, like did that hustle mold you to being that entrepreneur here today? That's a good question. I mean, what I feel, I feel like growing up very broke, as I said, growing up in the Heights, being broke, not a big deal. When we were in Florida, so my mom was a custodian and she worked for a certain school district. And one of the perks of working for a school district is even if you don't live in there, like your kids can go there. And so my brother and I, at the time, like we had access to this part of town that for the very first time, really, just kind of stepping into this upper middle class like world and all of a sudden I really felt the impact of what it meant to have come from like an uh, immigrant family with like low education with my parents stuff so, um, and it, you know it was present every day every day and I still you know I made friends and I did my thing and like I really enjoyed my time there but for me it kind of was always an underlying thing and I guess in the best possible way, it kind of put a chip on my shoulder. Like I felt like, do you know how frustrating it was where when I turned 16, like all my, ki all my friends at the school, like when they turned 16, they got a brand new, you know, Mustang GT, like literally brand new whips, big houses. You know, I never had my own room. All I wanted growing up was my own fucking room. Like I just wanted to just have, just so I can invite homies over and you know, all this other stuff. But, all those experiences molded, and I count myself even being bitter at my folks. Like, I can specifically recall, I got into playing guitar, and like, I had an, an older, uh, you know, kind of whack guitar, and my homie who had just gotten into playing guitar got the brand new model. His parents are like, oh, you're getting into this? Boom, a crazy amp. Oh, he's, he, all of a sudden he quit playing guitar, and then he got into UFC. Oh, you, boom, the sickest gloves, courses. And then he got into this and that. And anything he was doing, he was getting the brand new stuff. And I just remember at that point in time, I was frustrated, and I can recall even making my parents feel bad about it. And now fast forward, and we'll kind of cover the stuff in between, but now I see that that lack of 
breeding resilience. Like, I'm a fucking monster now. Like, tell me I can't have something. You know what I'm saying? But that only came as a result of not having. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, mobile city, right? So, um, when it comes to that company, when you just started, you're 18. So, you so, but before selling it, you were the CEO, you were the janitor. Yes. You know, you are in the department and marketing. But how <laughs> did you make sure that, you know, your business was going to be a success? Sure, sure. So context, so once I got back to the city, as I said, I was trying a bunch of you know, dead-end jobs, like doing whatever I could, and I landed a job as a doorman. And by the way, for you guys in school right now, that's when I was in PMCC. Like, I say this all the time, but opening up doors for people, open up doors for me. Like, my mom cleaned toilets for a living, my pops was a presser in a sweatshop, and they did it with a good attitude, and when I was in that building, you best believe, I was the best fucking doorman. Like, I just was. Like, people who have been there for years didn't even know the residents' names. Like, that always bugged me out, bro. How are you there and you see someone every single day and you don't ask them what their name is or care enough to remember? And so, you know, I was doing that for a while and look, it all boils down to this. There was a cat who's self-made millionaire who did time, Puerto Rican cat, and he saw me and he was like, yo, do not settle for being the doorman. Do not settle. And at, mind you, as a door, I was making 14 bucks an hour, which I enjoyed. Um, and you know, you could stay there, you can see a path to you getting union and all this other kind of stuff. And like, there are some people who make a you know, decent living doing that. You can make 50, maybe 60 racks a year in some places, which is already, both my parents combined made you know, less than 25K a year. Right, so like already that was a step up. So you can see the temptation to stay there, but he pulled me out and said, yo, never. Have, like you can, you can have your own door, man, my G. And he, he put me on. So he had a franchise of dry cleaners. And he said, yo, I'm gonna give you access to the cleaner. Just convince someone to give you their clothes. So like this jacket would cost me, I don't know, maybe 12 bucks to clean. Um, it would cost uh, me, because he would give me the rate on the low, four bucks. So. That's good, that's easy math to me. That's easy numbers, like, all right. I can get one thing, clean it for four and I make eight? All right, all with one piece, that doesn't sound like a lot, but fuck around, give me 100 pieces, give me 1,000 pieces, and like, I quickly found out that it doesn't matter how many times I open up that door, like my, someone else was determining my value. Like, okay, 14 bucks an hour. Which again, great rate, whatever, that, if that's your path, that's you. But for me, I almost had like a, it's almost like hip hop culture in a way where I was like, yo, who, who, like how can I live in such a way that someone else will determine my value? I was like, nah, with me, no. So that to me, like I became a business guy before I really knew what entrepreneur was and and you know, we'll get into this in a little bit, but I, I've heard some of the cats ask me about venture. Like before any of that stuff just came this intrinsic feeling of, I want to be in charge of my own destiny. But I mean, you didn't want to stop there because co-found Harlem, right? So you sold the company and it came in a clutch because you cut your parents a check yeah. and you had co-found um, yeah. Harlem up in the right So like, how did you and your co-founders manage to take on that risk, you know? Yeah, so I just wanna, um, let me just back up a little bit because that first experience with that company is usually breezed over um, because there was the, you know, the sexy badge of like an acquisition and people will look to that, but there's a lot of space in between. And so how many of you guys think that you want to be founders? Okay, and how many of you aren't sure, but like you know that you, you're not sure and you're, you're kind of testing it out. And how many of you are like dead fucking sure, like this is what I want to do? Wow, I saw that conviction too. They say, ooh. <laughs> um, so anyway, look, there's a lot to cover and I want to get to some of the things that I've been doing more recently too because I feel like this part of my life is well documented but I do just want to say that, um, oh, man, I can't, I can't explain it, but for me, it never came from a book, and it never came from a club, and it never came from a competition. But all those things are really important, and the fact that these support systems now exist 
like that decreases the pressure for us because to Devin's point, like you have cheerleaders. And by the way, I've been to those marathons and I've never run the marathon, but seeing those motherfuckers cheer you on gets me hype. They like cheer for you as if like they've known you for life. So like that's valuable. But I just wanna illustrate that like for at least in my personal experience, like that my drive didn't come from a result of that. I dug deeper, it has to come deeper than that. Because if you don't win the competition, and by the way, I've been to, I came to the Zahn Center three, maybe four years ago now, I did like a little talk when CoFound was just starting and it's really cool for me to see what it's grown into, but I met some founders that didn't win the competition and then what, they stop. Or didn't you know, get into a thing and then they stop and then they stop and then they stop. And that's fine too, because you're just kind of discovering if it's for you, but just know that if you want this life, you gotta dig deeper than the competition. You dig deeper than the club, you dig deeper than a talk. You dig all the way, and this is something I've been talking about a lot, but there's a lot of this natural kind of idolization where you see someone who's doing it and you're like, yo, you know what I'm saying? And you draw this power from something outside of you and that could be dangerous. That's a slippery slope. And it's not to say that don't get inspired, but don't get it twisted. Like the inspiration needs to come from right here. You know, and if you're tapped and tuned, then you can hone what it is that you feel drives you every day. And it could be something different for everyone. But for me, I was like, yo, I am fucking sick and tired of, uh, of like these everyday woes, man, where my mind was literally paycheck to paycheck. Like that shit is real, was real, is real, like will never leave me, ever. And I was like, yo, I'm gonna put this shit in my own hands. And so that's my North Star. And you know what I'm saying? It's all about kind of finding yours. So we can get into some of the other stuff now, but I, I didn't want to leave that point without saying that, yeah. in case you were struggling with that. I mean, you're doing a lot today. You're working on podcasts, you're you know, the real estate company. How is that going? Mm -hmm. It's kicking my ass, but it's going. Um, so the most meaningful way to, for me to sum up, like, so after I did this laundry business, I, sold to, I got into selling to film and television accounts and kind of built a business, learned a lot, lost a lot of money, been sued, sued back, hired, fired, fucking got into, there was one week where we had three car accidents in one week, like literally, he was bleeding from my nose, I was so stressed, like a lot, a lot of crazy shit, man. But like, if you notice, I feel that I hope, I hope that I'm emitting like a cool calmness, right? Because that's learned, right? Like that's experience. That's just going through the ringer so many times and being wildly high and wildly low and after a while it develops into a cool, calm demeanor and you can just assess things and make decisions. But so the more important experience of starting the company was developing that. And then I got into starting a little incubator here in Harlem, it's a not-for-profit, we, right around the time that Zahn actually was kicking off. And so, you know, I learned what it was like to help other people execute because it's one thing when you execute, it's another thing to, you know, and so over time, I guess the most important thing that I've learned, one of them, them is that I can't find a single other person who's had my career path. And that is value. Because if you guys go through the same, by the way, go through education, but if you go through the same education and then go through the same two year internship, and then do the same postgrad, and then come back and do the same track. Like, and by the way, again, I'm, it's always a push and a pull because that's probably a lot more um, impact than maybe some of our folks have been able to make, and they came here or you know went through what they went through to afford us those opportunities. But here's the kicker, right? Like, if you're the fucking same, you're gonna get the same like opportunities and shit. Like, you're not gonna get anything different, and so. It's been eye-opening for me because now I'm kicking back. I'm 25 and I'm getting, I'm sitting back and I'm looking at the landscape and I'm like, yo, what's going on here? Because I'm getting wildly differentiated opportunities. Like I'm hosting a show for Viceland and that shit is executive produced by Alicia Keys and Marcus Samuelson and fucking Cadillac. Like I'm literally driving a Cadillac on set, pulling up. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, getting out, there's a fucking crew. They're like, all right, John, cool. So we're, we're gonna grow this business. Like, what would you do next? And it's like, it's been a trip for me, but like, I'm starting to understand, oh my God. Like, the reason that I'm able to be at the center of a production like this, which is value, is because I've, 
I've been bold enough, I've been brave enough, even when I was scared shitless, to do it different. And when you do it different, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you were to map out physically on a line people's trajectories, people might be over here, I'm way the fuck, like, even if it's lower or higher, it doesn't matter, I'm just, I'm somewhere else. So be where other people aren't, I guess. You know what I'm saying? If you get that itch, you know, then, then do that shit. I mean, but your advice not, right? And they're following you around as you're investing in these companies. So yeah. the question is like, for, like, what's the macro understanding, you know, in relation to being a successful entrepreneur or an entrepreneur who, you know, Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the reason I'm doing the show and the premise is that they follow me as I advise and invest in different businesses. And the reason I really wanted to do this is because I really wanted to humanize what it's like to be a founder, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but there's been plenty of times where I was, when I was doing my first thing, even my second thing, even my third thing, you see Fast Company, TechCrunch, fucking Business Insider Inc. And like, and they're writing about the 20 something year old business girl wonder, or business boy wonder who went on and did what and what time? And you're like, damn, I've been doing this for how long and don't have a slice of the traction? What am I gonna do? There's a line from Kanye way back in the day, touch the sky. He goes, damn, these niggas that much better than me? Baby, I'm going on an airplane and I don't care if I'll be back again. So there was a time when, when Kanye was producing, when he was just in the lab and he was like, damn, these guys are that much better than me? Right, and so we go through that and the whole, sh the, the reason it's important to me to do the show and to do these talks and whatever is just to show that it's not like that. Is every, regular everyday people doing you know everyday things and fucking up and you know and growing gradually and that's okay too. But as a VC now, like, what do you look for an entrepreneur? You know, yeah. Because a lot of VCs have mentioned that it's the leader. You know, they look at the leader. You know, the attributes, their skills, and that determine whether the company is going to be a successful or a failure. You know, what is your take? Yeah. The point. The reason I made the point about the media. So. Um, I've come now to understand the way a lot of different industries work, even if just at a high level, but that's something that experience affords you. So I now understand that media, their job is to capture things in a sensationalized way, and then they have massive distribution, and then they fucking push it. And I remember the first time I dropped on, I think my first article was like Atlanta Black Star and then Inc. hit me up, and then Business Insider, and then Fast Company, and TechCrunch. I, I was really stoked to land my first TechCrunch. But that all happened within a very little concentrated period of time, where when one wrote about something, they felt the, the FOMO, fear of missing out, and the other publications quickly just covered the story, okay? And then there was a long window of ain't no attention, glory, nothing, but you gotta get back to hard work, and if you're lucky, you can make it back out on the other end, and get some recognition for the shit that you've done. But I realized, oh, media, that's their game. They get paid by driving traffic. And they drive traffic by, you gotta, they gotta stop you when you're going down your feed and say, oh shit, what's that? Boop, click, boom, then that worked, clickbait, right? And so the reason I say that is because they've focused on the Zuckerbergs or whatever because it's news. And I feel like a lot of kids that are starting and young people, like you want to start this company and you have this, maybe this trajectory in your mind of like Zuckerberg's never had a job, by the way. He's never had a job. He's, he's only started one company, like truly is an exception. Um, and so I preface that because, so we can dive into venture now. Um, so these days, co-found Harlem, which was this non-for-profit incubator that I had for years, I ended up realizing that my impact was probably limited um, by the amount of economic power that I could bring. And I, didn't, I had grander ambitions and I wanted to impact the conversation in a much fiercer way. And I kept running into, oh shit, I need to get grants. And so all of a sudden, the same shit that I was feeling when I was a doorman way back when, and I had someone else tell me my value, all of a sudden I realized like, damn, what I'm limited by is I gotta kiss someone's ass for a grant. Like, and, and, and if, if for them to give me the grant, I gotta, you know, have this 18 page fucking memo and I gotta track my progress this way and that way. And before I knew it, I was back to the drawing board. I was like, yo, that doesn't feel like, that doesn't feel empowering to me. And if I'm not empowered, I can't empower. 
And so we set out to find kind of the for-profit evolution of that. And I couldn't do it by myself. And by the way, I fell on my ass in front of everyone's face and you guys didn't know it. When I got a wave of press after a while, this is maybe the second time, I think there's been three times for me, the second time was really focused on, yo, this young guy is gonna be the, you know, Harlem's first venture capitalist. I just said that shit at a meeting and there happened to be a writer there. Again, sensationalized. She captured it, interviewed me, I played into it, I loved it, and those were genuinely my ambitions. But what happened? She dropped it. Boom, more and more and more people followed. But what it did is it created an outsized perception of where I was actually at. In reality, I was like, oh my God, I don't know the first thing about this. But in perception, again, sensationalized business boy wonder, and so it created this disconnect where I feel like I couldn't be vulnerable with people because like I'm seen a certain way. And, um, and at the same time, I did want to go there. So like, you know what I'm saying? It became this very interesting juxtaposition, this push and this pull. Um, and it's taken years and years. Like now I can say with confidence, I understand venture, but it's taken me years. Don't believe that if you read a book, you're gonna get it. Don't believe that if you're on your first company, you're gonna get it. You know, it takes a long time. I've now been doing this going on, 2019 will be eight years. Uh, you know, that'll be like a good chunk of my life. And certainly all, all of my adult life, I've dedicated to learning the ins and outs of all this stuff. So anyway, but it as, takes time. But as a student, like, where should they start venture, right? Because a lot of, I've heard a lot, of experience, a lot of people say that you have to have experience in entrepreneurship to then get into venture, venture, venture capitalists. Yeah, well, does anyone have aspirations to be a venture investor or you just, okay, we have a few. Does anyone want to, who wants to get VC funding? <laughs> That's the question here, right? Um, yeah, look, I like VC funding. I think it's very important. I think to year to day at Harlem Capital, we've seen 382 deals from the beginning of the year to now. That's a lot of volume. We're constantly diligencing, what have you. Um, the founders that stand out to me oftentimes are first time founders. Um, very mission driven. Um, but more importantly, if you haven't shown me or if you haven't demonstrated to the world at large that you can figure shit out, then we don't go with you. Even if you have a very impressive track record, even if you have on team the best paper, even if you have whatever. If for me, the more important thing is the ability to like be stopped and physically go around it. And like, we get good at exactly what we do the most of. So if you get really good about reading about business, or if you read a lot about business, you're gonna get good at reading about business, but it's not directly applicable, it's not one-to-one, -one. maybe a portion of it is, right? And so for, for us, like, I look for founders who have started with a product, has pivoted, has endured, has even quit, has quit that company, because they were like, all right, this ain't going anywhere. Because let's not get it twisted. Sometimes you're working on some shit that you know you're not fired up about anymore. And you, the market has responded that this is not the way. And a hard-headed motherfucker will just continue. But a smart person will just be self-aware and understand, okay, I have to adjust here. And that's okay. And like, there's a pressure face on like, oh, if you stop that one idea, you didn't make it. But what the fuck are you talking about? I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I started Kofi Harlem, built it, did okay with it, learned, and realized this is not the vehicle right this moment to continue this mission. And so stop, took a step back, pivoted, came around, boom, Harlem Capital, $25 million fund. Now what? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Word, yeah, so. <laughs> So yeah, man. Um, so anyway, that's so that's my take on venture, right? And I know we're getting into like now what, but um, a it takes a lot of time to learn. B you don't need it right now. You don't. It's, it comes with a lot of pressure, and like I'm not saying don't go for it, but too many people are are valuing their are measuring their value as an entrepreneur based on like funding. Some of the best founders in the world don't raise. Like your best investor is your customer, right? Like fuck figuring out how to get someone to write you money so that you can spend it. How about focus on making it? 
Like, what can I sell you, you, yes, you, with the polka dotted socks? Okay, cool, I see you have a fashion sense. All right, is there a need for fashion? Boom, 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 ask around, wow, there's enough people who would maybe buy something like that. You know what I'm saying? If it, I mean, if it's in line, yeah, you found your little niche, riches and niches. Okay, how do I reach people like that? Okay, cool, they're at entrepreneurship club, so can I sponsor an entrepreneurship club? Or can I show up and do a pitch at an entrepreneurship You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how my mind thinks. It's like quickly spotting, oh, okay, there's that obscure thing that people may want. How can I reach them? Let me start. And that's the more healthy approach to building a business versus like starting and being like, okay, cool. I'm starting my company day one. I know that I want a million dollars in funding. What can I do to get that funding? That's a broken model. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah, it's, it's baby steps. So in terms of pitching, right, and networking, like, what's your take on that as students? Because I want to come from our viewpoint, because we're trying to get to a certain level in life, and we can't just walk in front of a lot of <laughs> like, hey, we have this company, it's almost like, what do you have to show? So how can we work on that networking and that elevator pitch? Um, yeah, this is a question I get a lot, too. Um, I don't really believe in this fly-by, give me your card type of bullshit. I just don't. Like, I'm not gonna remember you that way, and neither is someone who also has a lot on their plate, but I am gonna remember that person who said, yo, I caught you that one time, and like really liked when you said this, and it made me think of this, and therefore that prompted me to do this. What do you think about that? I respond to doing, I respond to doing. You know what I mean? Like I had someone reach out and say, yo, how can I be your videographer? And he hits me up every so, every so often. And yeah, on one hand, like that's cool that he's following up, he got the diligence. But on the other hand, why the fuck haven't you just gone to YouTube and just sliced up little clips and threw some music in and show me what you can do? Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? And so for me, some of the dearest mentors that I have in my life, um, a, it started with just like an earnest disposition, so they knew, uh, they sensed, okay, maybe there's something there. And they, and they would say, okay, you know what I think you should do? This. And I would follow up the next week, like, yo, all right, cool, listen, I did that. And they would be like, huh, interesting. And over time, these have become some of my most beautiful, warmest relationships that I have. Uh, mentorship is a very beautiful relationship. It's not really like having a bunch of mentors and saying, yo, I got mentor, mentor. It's like, in my opinion, it's like two to three people that really stick with you and, and they don't do it for money. Don't go to people that do it for money. Don't, don't, you know, people who actually grow to invest in you as a person. So that's my advice around like how to meaningfully connect with someone. Be rooted in doing, be earnest. And if you combine those two over time, you end up developing these special, special types of relationships. So you have the three companies. I mean, what's next on your list of ventures? Like, are you sticking with just a podcast with eBay? Are you gonna start a new company? Are you sticking with, you know, social entrepreneurship and expand in Harlem? Do you wanna, you know, move around? Yeah, um, let me put it this way, right? So, at some point, you can either be a very public-facing entrepreneur if you want, or you can be very low pro. There's not one better than the other. I know low profile guys way more successful than me and, and like the, the slippery slope is when you're public facing but you're not rooted in anything. I can tell those guys from a mile away. You know, they become, they develop this career on speaking on this and videoing on that and stuff like that but when you lift the hood there's nothing there and I felt at one point if I were to be vulnerable that I was at danger of going that route and I needed to get back to doing. Um, and so, but, what I didn't want to ignore was the fact that I did keep getting media opportunities my way because people were like, yo, this is compelling. This is like, you're compelling. And that would be silly too, to not be aware enough to be like, okay, cool. I should make this part of my game. And you know, eBay did offer me the chance to host a podcast for them. Now I'm hosting one for the Washington Post. Um, um, but also speaking, also content, like I, who I am. And by the way, that begets so many opportunities. So if you even have any inkling of that in you, I would legitimately like execute on that in as small a way as possible, whatever, you know, because it feeds more, it feeds more stuff. So anyway, media is part of my game and you know, then I've gone on to invest in real estate and venture. Um, the important thing there is that 
there's a reason that I get these opportunities. We talked about it before, but having like a differentiated view. Another thing is you gotta be top five. So when someone thinks of whatever it is that you're doing, if you're not top five, you're fucking up. It's either you're in a category that's too broad or you are not in the conversation for your smaller category, right? So as an example, like when we did incubators, when you thought of top five incubators, we were definitely not on that list. Absolutely not. It's too broad. And so then, you know, we had to, we brought another element in. We did the Harlem piece and, and there begun my brand equity, you know, and now when you think of Harlem entrepreneur, I'll be damned if you Google Harlem entrepreneur and I'm not 75% of that listing, I'll be damned. Test it, right? But that's because I was intentional about where I wanted to be, that was gonna be my lane and I captured that. And from that, I now can step into a bigger category and be top five there, right? And the reason top five is important is because when these brands have these conversations, when they say, yo, we're doing a new project, um, who would be good for this? Anyone have any ideas? And then they'll say, oh, well, uh, there's this, you know, there's this girl, Madison Jay, that I heard about, or this guy, John Henry, that I heard about. You gotta be right there. You know what I'm saying? If you want more plays. It's like if you're on the court, if you ain't create, if you're not moving in such a way that creates plays, you're gonna have less buckets, right? And so I don't know about you guys and like what your fundamental ambitions are, but for me, I need to be a playmaker. If I'm on the team, I need to be contributing. I need to be open, I need to be passing, I need to be shooting, I need to be trying to get into the paint. And so content has been a very effective way for me to get into a space where I can, you know, make plays happen. I mean, I know you're also trying to expand the entrepreneurial you know, mindset within. Yeah. Right, like me tasting that ruined everything for me. Like once I understood that empowerment is because it's my life mission. Not only, and not, not in this evangelist way where I'm like trying to get you to do it and you to do it. Like I'm trying to get me to do it at a very high level and hopefully by example, other people are like, yo, that seems dope and they want to do that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, like just me just being real now, like guys, I'm, so let me get practical, right? Cause I've been high. Guys, you can make a lot of fucking money <laughs> by just sharing what you know if what you know is distinct enough, which is what we talked about. Right, like, guys, like right now my rate is uh, 7.5 to 10 racks, right, in an hour to go and do a keynote, right? Obviously I'm not charging City College, I never charge City College, but like, as, <laughs> appreciate that. There, there was a time where like, that shit took me four or five months to earn, and never mind earn, I was gonna have dipped into that shit before I even saw it, and like, now, but the point is like, okay, cool. I can do a talk, right? Right, and then while I'm there, you're connecting with people, so if you're smart enough to capture it, now you have footage, now you slice that shit and drop little 60 second clips on Instagram, micro content, you feed and nurture and, and further connect with the same people that you just had a chance to touch in person, and that's how you build resonance, right? And after you build resonance, then someone like an eBay might come up and say, yo, John, do you wanna get paid now to host our podcast? Because by the way, we've been looking for someone, but we love your viewpoint. And we love the fact that you have an audience. Let's, let's not, let's keep it real. They're looking for a host with an audience so they can push their own shit. I'm not stupid, but I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I think I would do that. And but then while I'm hosting that on a high level, which by the way, that, that podcast had at that time 75,000 listeners per episode, boom, I'm amplified, more people find out, more people come check me out, more people engage, right? And it only matters because I feel I'm driven by something genuinely good. So now I'm participating in the conversation and in a meaningful way, I feel, and then it paves the way for more and more opportunities. And now I got to the point where I'm like, all right, cool. I've learned a lot about co-found Harlem, how to incubate businesses. Like I want to put money into businesses and not on some Mother Teresa type shit, on some, yo, I want to invest in you and get a chunk of your business because I want you to do well and I want to do well too. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm understanding economic empowerment in that sense, but guess what? I can make a lot of noise for Harlem Capital because I have all these other channels. You know what I'm saying? And so, I guess over time, you, over time your game just becomes so tight if you, you know what I'm saying? Like 
if you're cons like, oh man, then there's, there's so many fundamental things that you have to get right. But I think the most important one is just bear in mind that you can legitimately make a wildly fulfilling career for doing exactly what you love. Like exactly. So um, that was my last one. Let's, let's do some q and if we have a little bit of time. Thank you, guys. Got to bounce in a little bit. Um, cool. We have time. Questions. Yeah, we have time. You said you play the guitar. Do you still play the guitar? Two. Second question is, uh, what have you found to be the most effective channel in sourcing deals for? Okay. Great question. Um, um, I don't typically still play that much, but I still can play. You give me an axe, and I will play. Um, but 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 here's the cool part, right? So after so I was a jazz musician mostly growing up, and like that was how I identified for a long time. And then I went through a period of time where I didn't have anything that I could identify with. And it felt like a lie for me to still say I was a jazz player because it wasn't me anymore. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then when I got, you know, discovered like first corporate and then finance and then I went through a lot of stuff to discover that I love the freedom of being an entrepreneur. Here's the cool shit. Now, years later, I see, oh, our passions never leave us. Like, now, when I do a show or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, now I'm thinking of like, okay, cool. So on this first season, we hired, we got someone else's music, but on, on the next season, can I produce my own sounds? Because I still know how to make music and I can bring in my boys and still know how to make music. And then all of a sudden we have the original score for the production and I get paid and can pay my boys to make music. So, you know what I'm saying? So like, your passions never leave you. So anyway, there's that um, two, um, two um, for your question about venture. Um, yeah, the best, the best channel to source deals. Is it in like meetups? Is it like call out people reach out to you and you get more of those? Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting because we might get more volume from deals and stuff like that, but oftentimes the founders that we yeah, it's hard to say who you're going to connect with at any given moment. We've, I met a founder at a dinner, I really liked her, ended up investing in her. It runs the gamut, but, um, and you'll hear people say, yo, get a warm intro all the time. And that, that helps. Um, but I would say do something creative to get someone's attention. I think at the, at the root of it, that's kind of the, the most distinct um, thing you can do. Thanks, Sue. Hi. Hey, man. What's your name? Oh, Corey, Corey. right? Corey. Um, typically, what is your investment thesis? Um, how do you go about sourcing deals? How do you finally decide on who to invest in? And what is your follow up? Like, how do you regularly check in? Or do you just hand over the, you know, the cash or, or how, the capital? And then we don't just hand over the cash, okay. I assure you. <laughs> How do, yeah. you, how do you make sure that they're hitting the metrics? Copy, 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 copy. <laughs> We're on production these days and everything's like copy, 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 I'm like copy, copy. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Everyone's on walkies and shit. Um, guys, look. Um, man. All right. I, w I wanna, I'm going to answer your question directly, but just please don't forget what I said about like, customers being your most important investors. Um, but, okay, so for sourcing, um, okay, there's a number of things that we look for. I'll, I'll try to offer some practical value. So investing is very risky. Investing in real estate is risky, but it's not as risky as investing in fucking startups. Like if you look, like startups are wildly risky. And so we as LPs, as I'm sorry, as um, VCs, venture capitalists, right? Is, let me share with you how a fund actually works, okay? Because I'm not sure that it's, it's clear. So we are what's called general part. There are two types of partners in a fund, okay? There's general partners and there's limited partners. The GPs, general partners, we don't actually, we're not rich, okay? What we have is a lot of guts, a lot of bravery, a lot of, you know, fucking, you know, we have a thesis. You can have a cryptocurrency thesis, you can have a real estate thesis. Our shit is like, yo, we want to invest in women and people of color because we feel that they're not getting enough capital. Okay, cool. Then you got to go and convince people to invest in your fund, right? But now, 
that adds a lot of pressure because you're investing other people's money. And so if you're investing other people's money in a very risky thing, you, ha you look for certain criteria that's gonna mitigate that risk. You know it's still gonna be risky, but you need to de-risk as much as you can, right? So one, the first thing you look for is, you know, that like a solid management team and not how it's, not like on paper, like a team. I'm talking about motherfuckers who have relevant actual experience in that space. Another thing you look for, and this is something that people take for granted, is if this, in order for me to make my money back, right? Because we, we talk a lot about putting money in, but let's talk for a moment about getting money out. We only make money in real estate. I cash flow every month when people pay me rent. That doesn't happen in a startup. You're not ever expected to be profitable until like the very fucking end. So we only, and even when you are profitable, you don't share checks with investors. So literally we only make our money back if you get acquired at the very end. And so in order for us to get our money back, we think, okay, cool, this company's valued at this. Companies in their space are being acquired at this valuation, and the companies that are being acquired have this amount of revenue, let's say 20 million in revenue. So can we see a path for this team to reasonably, within reason, get to that revenue mark? Right, so we reverse engineer everything. Um, and there, there's a lot, and maybe there's not the time for it right now, but venture can be technical to understand how an investor thinks. And once you understand how an investor thinks, you can frame your presentation as a founder totally fucking differently. So I guess I'll leave you with, try to understand the mind of a, of a venture investor. And, and I understand that was the purpose of that question, but maybe you and I can kick it separately. We'll jump on an Instagram live. Don't forget, we'll actually do this. And we'll, we'll do an IG live and we'll talk about um, this nitty gritty adventure. And if people care, they can tune in. And if not, they can tune out. Does that sound good? Yeah, Thanks, Corey. John. Hey, Glenn. Just to make a point that you're making, so you have to remember to that. Glenn Patterson, everyone. A legend is in the building. Yeah. Investing my own money. VCs invest in someone else's money. So my behavior behind an investment might have a different thesis and a different behavior. I'm going to be very, very early, understand the founder, and at the same time, that exit John is looking at, I'm looking at how that exit is going to operate 3x, 4x. So the behavior for John is 20, 30x at uh, basically somebody acquiring our IPO. And for the angel, it's basically, okay. What does the next two, three rounds look like? So you need to understand who you're going to talk to. Yeah, so for sure. Early, you don't want to go talk to John because his behavior is different. So those are the things that- That's true. Change. That's facts. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn, for that important point. Angels invest their own money. VCs invest other people's money. Maybe one more and then we wrap, or two, two more and then, uh, and then we could just formally end. Hi, first of all, nice to meet you. I've been following you on LinkedIn and I'm just so excited that you came. Um, Thank so my you. question is, what was the main reason that allowed you to make the decision and drop out of college? Because I feel like a lot of us are like, college, you know, we gotta get that first. So Ooh. what was that one decision for our adult? That's a very good question. And all I can say is that it was never, for me, it wasn't a like, all right, this is college, I'm going to leave it. It was actually more so when I, so I was, to give you the rundown, all right, I was working a graveyard shift as a doorman from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., so literally working at night, and then going straight to school. And then I had a, a couple hours of downtime. That was my life for a little while. And when I got into doing this side hustle, which would go on to become a company, but it was my little side hustle, you know what I'm saying? I started, sell I started selling. I was like, all right, I'm kind of good at this. So I selling, started selling, started get customers. And when you get customers, you get money, but you also get responsibilities. And so before I knew it, as my customer base grew, I literally, I, like, I had time, like I had to fulfill orders and shit. And then it just, it was a very practical matter of like, okay, there's only so much time in the day. 
I can't go to this class today. Like if I, it's either I go to that class or I don't fulfill these orders. And that's a personal decision that you make. For me, it was kind of very easy. I was like, all right, cool. I got some customers. And it all boiled down to one moment. I was sitting in a classroom in a business law class, right? And we were learning how to negotiate a contract in real life, or I'm sorry, in, in the classroom. And at the same time, my mentor had given me my first contract that I was actually negotiating. And for me, I was like, I couldn't wrap my head around why I was even in that classroom because I had an actual deal that was waiting for me to you know, require my attention. And so you know, I packed up my stuff and I, yo, teach. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> and I bounced. And I never stepped foot again. Then the, the next time I was back, it was to teach, like to talk to kids about, you know, business, which I thought was ironic. But, you know, it doesn't have to be your choice or whatever. It's just, I'm just really big on acting on what feels right to you. And what felt right to me, as scary as it was, was not being in the classroom. It was being out in the trenches. Hi there. What's up, man? Um, so let me start off by saying this, like, a, I just have like a seed idea, and I'm really like, this is my first time. Like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I want to, you know, determine my own value and all that. So that's pretty scary to me, but you know, fuck it, go all in, right? That's right. Um, so I have this idea where like I want to challenge the MTA and eventually replace them because you know, like, fuck the MTA, they're bullshit. <laughs> Um, so my thing is, you know, I'm going against this titan, and I just want to know how do you distinguish between obstacles you have to overcome, because, you know, on the road to success, you can come to obstacles, and obstacles where you need to backtrack and take another route. Um, the, look, the best way, have you ever been in a fight? You ever been punched in the face? Yeah. This shit hurts. Okay. And when you, you know, like, <laughs> but I look at these UFC fighters, right, and like, you know, they just take blows. And like, for me, the equivalent in, in this world, in this realm, is that, remember I said we only get exactly, we get good at exactly what we do the most of. And so when I had my first couple hurdles, like, they just felt very real. And I was like, fuck. I gotta do this, I gotta get a business certificate, I need $120, like, you know, you know how many clothes I gotta sell to get that? But you do it, right? And, and is that, is the actual act of going and moving around obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, big, sometimes it's small and you're like, whew, dodge the bullet. Sometimes you learn, oh, if I prepare, I could avoid this obstacle. And sometimes other shit happens. And sometimes you plan really well and look to avoid it and it still happens. And sometimes some really good shit happens that you didn't expect. And like it's that literally, it's that walking that path and just like being on your toes, boom, boom, moving around, moving around, responding, responding. And, and over time, you develop what, you develop this grit. You develop this, and it's not even a grit, you don't have to be loud and shit to be gritty and like you don't, you don't have to be Eric Thomas, E.T., the hip hop preacher. You see him always yelling. That's good. At, you know, that's how he does it. But the point is, you nurture that ability to be like, okay, you, it's pattern recognition. Uh, I know what this is. This is a problem. This is what it's going to take. It's very stressful, and I can stress out if I want, but like, I know that's not going to serve me. So let me just chip away at it or see what I can do. And so, you know, that's, my, that's the best answer I can come up with. It's like you're going to be faced with stuff, but it's the consistency of dealing with the good and the bad, and you, eventually you just get really good at dealing with shit, period. You know? Thank you. Absolutely. Time for one last question. Okay. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, my question is a little more broad. I, um, I'm wondering how you personally um, how did you deal with the, how did you manage the fear of failure when you hadn't yet established a track record? I know that after, you know, experience after experience, you start to be able to trust yourself, but before any of that, how do you find yeah. the fear enough to get started? Yeah, let me put that into perspective. You actually get way scared to fail after you have a track record. 
Like I care, you know, in, in, in my best moments, I'm tapped and tuned into myself. But in my most vulnerable moments, I'm like, wow, I kind of have a bigger stage than I've ever had. And if I fuck up now, it's gonna be way, it's gonna be broadcast. And people are, are gonna love, they love to pick you apart. So I'll be put on display, man. I'll be left to dry, right? So like, think about like a hip hop artist, like first album, great, I dropped Illmatic. Second, it was written. Third, Nostradamus, that shit was a flop. You know what I'm saying? So earlier on, just nurture this mode of like, I hate to break it to you, but kind of no one gives a shit about what you're doing when you first start. And that's great. That's, you know, you're, you're trying to fight for attention and recognition and by the time you get it, you realize, damn, it's a kind of a curse in a way. It's blessings to it because you have more responsibility and more reach, but at the same time, right now relish in that and being anonymous. Relish in the fact that you can screw up and loud and do so many things and like no one's gonna know or care for a little while. And eventually, if you explore in this unknown for long enough, whoop, you sprout up and then you become a player on the scene. And then, you know, then you worry more so about failures and stuff. Um, so relish in that. Relish in not being known for right now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Wait. Um, I want to put you guys on my gram, actually. So... So I just want you guys to just make ridiculous noise. Um, ready? What up, Instagram? We're here at City College. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Yo, much love. Thank you, everyone. We're coming, spending some light, and hopefully we'll see you again. Yes, absolutely. I, I will be back as many times as you want me. So if you do stay back, you might get it in time. That was awesome. <laughs>